We're going to get started in just about a minute or so. So if you could take your seats, we'll jump right into this. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I'm just going to start off with uh, <laughs> not necessarily restricting the end of but just like having the options that we can serve. Uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, good morning, everyone. We got a regular mic today, not a lapel mic. Lapel mics and I don't get along, so thank you for being here. If you could all have a seat and slow your conversations at least to a, a nil, we'll get started. Um, this is, I'm Don Ulrich. Hi, Don. Hi. Can everybody pay attention, please? I'll go to my old teacher voice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm Don Ulrich. I work with uh, Clovis Unified Schools in uh, Middle Earth in California in the Valley, and I'm the cash chair. So welcome to the uh, membership meeting for June. Um, it's, it's great to have everyone here. This meeting is streamed live, so welcome to everybody out there that's uh, tuned in to our meeting. Just a reminder, you know, when we get questions today to the presenters, uh, remember to repeat the question, kind of clarify, so those people out in the audience that are uh, tuned in, understand the question and understand our conversation. As you know, if you've ever been on a webcast, unless you have those questions repeated, sometimes it's really hard to follow the conversation we're going to have. Um, first time attendees, we have a tradition of, of embarrassing you, but really getting to know you. So if you're a first time attendee, can you volunteer, raise your hand, and then introduce yourself and where you're, where you're from? Anybody? Okay, all veterans today. That's great. Um, just want to frame a little bit for you where, where cash is. The big, the big issue, of course, that we're working on is implementation of Prop 51, ensuring that uh, the will of the voters is upheld by uh, legislation and the governor and the Department of Finance. And we are facing challenges. We are facing tough challenges with that. Um, just to remind you, if you weren't there, I haven't heard about it, the SAB at the June 5th meeting took some action and chose an option for implementing Prop 51 and specifically made a recommendation and it took an action that changes the way new construction eligibility would be determined. They basically said that uh, when your application that's on the acknowledge list, now they call it the workload list, comes up you know, for processing, the school district would have to reestablish their eligibility. So I'll just an example would be Clovis Unified. We have two new schools that are on the acknowledge list, probably 11 to 12 million apiece. And when will they come up? Will it be next month? Will it be next year for eligibility? So it's, it's not certain, right? We are a growing district, so probably we will have eligibility. But what if you're a district that is facing a flattening of their enrollment? They needed a school four years ago. They might have built it. Now they might not be eligible, and is that fair to them? We, we think not. 
And we also think uh, that advice from uh, our cash legislative team and we got some legal advice is that we really feel like the action they took might be in violation of the statute, which, as you know, Prop 51 approved by the voters approved the statute without change. So cash is, as an organization, is looking into options that we can take to make sure that the students, the teachers, the districts of California, that the, they're not harmed. And that's, that's what we're looking into. You know, we'll keep you updated as we process that, but we're looking into what options we can take so there isn't harm to our school districts and to our kids and to our teachers. So moving on from that, um, just the business of cash, making sure everybody's informed. Um, the Legislative Advisory Committee has now opened for uh, some new members. We have four public sector seats that are open and one private. The submittal deadline is uh, just uh, this Friday, so you got two days to get that in. Um, and really just to remind people, you know, the Legislative Advisory Committee for Cash is a real important, viable organization. The purpose really is that with all the legislative issues that come up with that affect facilities in California, the cash board really needs a conduit to all our constituents. And so the Ca Legislative Advisory Committee is ma made up of private sector or different organizations and kind of subgroups, of course, district people. And so the idea is that under Rob Pierce's leadership, who's a cash board member, we're getting the information on legislation issues from those constituents. And that con it's a conduit to the board, the cash board, so we make sure we make informed decisions about positions the cash organization takes on legislative issues. So if you're interested in that, please apply. Next thing of business would be the June workshops uh, that we're just getting through. Just this is more informational, but there is one tomorrow. Uh, it's the path to zero net energy going beyond lighting and HVAC on school sites. It's at uh, the Doubletree uh, in Ontario. We had the workshop yesterday in Sacramento. And there's a networking mixer coming up. That is in Fremont. And I don't know how to pronounce that. Ca okay, Greg, Campo de Boca. Bocce, see? I knew I'd mess it up. I've been to Italy once, so you got to give me a break. <laughs> that is Thursday, July 13th, 2017, from 5 to 7 p.m. So if you're in the area, make sure you can attend that. Next, just fall conference is coming up before you know it. October 18th, 20th is our uh, annual conference and pre-conference workshop. It's at the Duke Hotel in Newport Beach. And that's formerly the Fairmont Hotel. So please save that date and plan to attend. Next thing is this cash weekly update email is an important way to get information out. So check your inbox on that. This information as Prop 51 implementation and the different parts of that happen. This is a good way to stay in touch with that on a, on a daily, weekly basis. Okay, So it's, it's a good piece of information to stay attuned to. So to get right into our program today, we have state agency updates. Uh, first from uh, the Department of State Architecture. Is uh, Kirk Cooknick here yet? <coughs> Not seeing anybody volunteer to raise their hand. If you want me to talk about the DSA issue, I can do that. <laughs> See, Tom could always fill a few minutes. And there is a DSA issue that, you know, is important about fee changes. So Tom, Tom's uh, knowledgeable of that, knows the history knows history about just about everything. So Dr. Duffy, that'd be, a, that'd be great. Okay. And we'll, if, if we'll go to the next person, and then when he comes, we'll try to get him put in. Okay. I brought my coffee with me. I, I, did, I didn't know I was going to jump up here. Uh, so I, I've talked to you about this before, but uh, the, the proposed fee increase for DSA that was in the, the trailer bill that I've mentioned going back several months has uh, now become uh, part, part of the law. And uh, so it, it – and I can go through the details of, of that for you if, you if you like. I have the details because the, the state architect was kind enough to uh, send that to me when, when I asked for uh, the – what the cost would be for just – regular projects. But, but let me just give you a little bit of background. So the, the state architect 
uh, and I uh, met several months ago, and he was very upfront. He said, I want to let you know that we're seeking a fee increase. The fee for the structural uh, safety review is something that's in statute. And we, we can't just make a change without a change in the statute. And, and, and we knew that. The, uh, under the prior administration, there, there was uh, some disgruntlement over the fact that, <clears throat> that it was in statute and they wanted to increase the fees. And they said, we're going to go and we're, we're going we're to get an author. We're gonna, they told us this. And we're going to increase the fees. And in fact, we're going to change the law so that you don't have to do it statutorily. We'll, we'll allow it to be done administratively. And we said, no, you're not. We will challenge you on that. And, and we, we believe this is significant. So the administration last time backed away. Here, the estate architect was, was very upfront, said we, we need this fee increase. The re reason we need it is that since 10, 2004, we've, we've had salary and benefit increases for our employees that have increased by about 45%. I thought that was staggering. You know, I haven't seen that happen in school districts, uh, but, <clears throat> but I believe him. He also said we need to hire more uh, staff, and we're anticipating this, this deluge of uh, projects to come to DSA because of all the local bond measures that have passed over the last year and, and before, as well as the state bond. And he said, and we need to move forward with technology. And, and, of course, we're in support of them uh, having adequate staff and also technology. And here's Kurt Kutnick, and he's, he's from DSA. So I'm, I'm the straight man. You can, be the, you can be the funny guy. Come on up. So what I'm talking about, Kirk, is, uh, and is Kirk Kutnick's the deputy state architect with the Division of State Architects, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Hi. I was just talking about the, the fee increase, and you can, you can step in and you can talk about it if you like. Certainly. And then I can I can ask questions from the back and heckle, okay? Do what you do best. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry I'm late. <clears throat> Thank you. It's been a trying day, and it's only a little after 11. So uh, we have met before. I think we met about a month and a half, two months ago. So. And I came back. <laughs> I came back here. I came back to DSA. Um, yeah, I just keep coming back for more. Um, so uh, let me give you a little overview of, of what's going on. As Tom mentioned, the trailer bill was signed yesterday. And uh, if there's someone in the room that doesn't know what that is, you might want to think about another line of work. <laughs> but uh, so um, what we're looking at right now, and just, just so we're clear, the, the the numbers that are provided, the percentages, uh, the 1.0 and the 1.25, um, those aren't forever, those aren't fixed, um, and they're not going to happen right away. The legislation authorizes a July 1. We're actually looking at moving that out, um, and we're not fixed on a date yet. We're thinking September 1st, but in all fairness to the districts, we want to make sure we give ample notice so that you folks have time to adjust as well. And I know it's not a lot of time, but it is... Um, something that we are taking into consideration is how this affects you. Um, you know, the, the, the reasons for the fee increase can be argued, but the fact of the matter is is that uh, when I came to DSA and learned that uh, we were looking at um, running a deficit, we're borrowing money from uh, the Department of General Services, and uh, there had been about a 45% uh, increase in salaries, and that's something we're not under control of. The state architect, the deputy, uh, even uh, the uh, director of DGS is not in control of. That's a labor issue between the unions and uh, labor. So um, it's not something that we can control. It's something that we have to live with and adjust to, and that's what we're doing. I know it probably feels like we're balancing the books on the backs of the districts, um, and that certainly is not our goal. Our goal is to make sure that we have operating funds, and that's why that uh, statute has in place uh, that there is a six-month uh, operating fund in there for us. It's not something that we're going to um, continue to amass uh, uh, reserves. It's six months worth of reserves, and then we throttle it back. Now, uh, when we put the fees into place, when we throttle them back, that is a projection for us uh, to consider for you and for you to be aware of. Um, and I'm, I'm um, tipping our hand a little bit here, but again, in transparency and fairness, which is what Chet wants to make sure that we are providing to the districts as well as the good 
uh, review service is um, that uh, it would be something for your business managers to be aware of where we're at in our reserve capacity as you move forward. If you're looking at a $110 million high school and you're looking at the fees, where are we at now, where are we going to be when the project is complete and ready for submission, and where is DSA at the reserves? There's a delta there that your business office may want to consider because on that kind of money, we're talking about a lot of difference in fees. Yes? I interrupted. I am one of those districts, so I'm at the Pomona High School District. My name's Jenny. And um, those, those fees are going to greatly impact uh, my project submission. So the question I have <coughs> is, would there be a consideration of reimbursement um, after the six-month evaluation to those districts that do go ahead and move their projects forward? You know, we're talking about about a million dollars. Uh, fee based upon the $110 million project. So um, if you find that, you know, you're, you're, you're basically overcharging if you're collecting that much fee, is there going to be some reimbursement to those projects? Uh, that has not been discussed. And actually those discussions... Can you repeat the question for those? Oh, I'm sorry. So Jenny's, Jenny's question for Kern County was, um, will there be a, a, a reimbursement for uh, schools that are somehow caught in the queue and, and she said she's looking at about a million dollars in fee on a, what's your, your uh, scope of your project? It's a comprehensive high school, so okay. it's over a hundred million dollar project. Yeah, so we're talking about a hundred plus million dollar high school, hundred, a million dollar fee, and the difference there of, of what can you get back. No, I cannot answer that. No, that has not been discussed. It's certainly something we're always availing ourselves to consider how we can help the districts. Um, uh, we are fee for service, make no mistake, but, um, you know, w again, as I said, we're not trying to balance our books on the backs of the districts. That's not in our interest, nor is it in yours in developing your projects and delivering the goal, the object of the transaction, which is education. So we are keenly aware of that, and we are making sure that everybody on staff is keenly aware of that. So, um, so with, with, with regard to that very matter, yes. will, will you be designating somebody internally that No, it's internal. We already have, we have a business manager in our office who, who uh, provides us with all the data of where we're at at any given moment on any uh, data-derived information that we have on hand for every district, every project that's at DSA. And so we will know um, with some room for wiggle uh, when we will be arriving at our reserves based on what we have in the queue. Now, you bring up a great question, and that this is where the question really comes home is we meet our reserve, and then we take in projects after the fact, and we are still piling on money. That's, that's the gist of the whole thing is what are you going to do with that excess funds is what, what it really amounts to, and that is an excellent question. I'll take that back to chat for us to mull over and see how we address that. Sorry, I just don't mean to no, not, no. your time, but just one more My time is your time. Yeah. Is that nexus of the type of project that you're evaluating, is there some way to, you know, I don't want to subsidize with my fee, I understand you're a fee for service, but I don't want to subsidize with my fee other projects, and so I would ask you to consider the nexus between the fee that you collect for by project mm -hmm. and, you know, identify it. Rather than by date. Yeah. Because um, right. of when it's you got in the queue and then you, I understand. Right? I understand. So I don't mind Well, I, I made a note, and I, I will take this back to Chet, and we'll talk it over with our business agent. Tom, did you finish your thought there? Uh, I think in answering Jenny's question, I think you, you answered mine. I was just wondering, you know, who's the canary that's going to, you know, when the canary falls, and we, we know that, that you've gone over. Well, I know that the canary isn't the... Uh, Grand Canary of the first canary. <laughs> so um, it's 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 in line. And so uh, 
That's that's how it's going to work. It'll just be something we get to talk about more at these monthly meetings. I, and I enjoy that, and I'll update you regularly on that, so yeah. it's not a concern at all. Uh, again, we'll be 100% um, transparent. There's no value in us being opaque on the issue. It doesn't serve anybody's interests. If there is a problem, that's how we find it, that's how we solve it. And that's Chet's philosophy, that's my philosophy, and that's how we're moving forward. Well, if you'll hear us say this often. You're a public agency, so we trust you. And I appreciate that. I am with the government, and I am here to help. So I, I, I know that you know. Sometimes you feel like, uh, be glad you're not getting all the government you pay for. But I, I think uh, we're a little different over at DSA. Um, any, any more questions on fee? Good, because I'll, I'll just roll back over into something else regarding fee and time, and that is uh, the the old measure for our performance bin time and our movement away from that. And um, so uh, the appointment system, you may have heard me say this in the past, you've heard Chet bring it up, it's the direction we're moving in now. Um, we're looking at going live with that um, July 31st. Um, and it's interesting because one of my, uh, and I'll, I'll just be open with you about it, one of my goals coming to DSA was um, what I call the Chipotle theory, if you will, uh, getting a Chipotle chicken burrito at Chipotle in LA, Orange County, Oakland, or Sacramento, it should be the same burrito, should taste the same. And so we're doing the same kind of work, using the same policies, procedures, forms, regs. So why should anything be different from office to office? And there is a profound cultural difference from office to office, I'm learning. I'm getting my bell rung weekly on this stuff. <laughs> But um, it's still a goal of mine. And um, some offices, though, factually, are just more progressive in their thinking. Their, their staff is uh, more private, cent private sector centered, and they have that private sector mentality. And so um, San Diego is, is the example we often use. Uh, they are very forward thinking. They are early adopters. In fact, uh, they're, they're a bit ahead of the curve on this one, thanks to Craig Rush and Paul Rooney. Um, they're looking at every way to be more efficient that they can be uh, with what they have to work with. And so initially we were talking about, um, because I know you've heard it before, um, about 78% uh, of our projects are a million dollars or less uh, over the counter in access. And so our first thought was we will do a million dollars or less OTCs and access as part of this appointment process. Craig Rush, on the other hand, said, why are we doing that? Let's just do them all. Well, there's a tendency to want to um, take things in small bites and, so, and, and move into our comfort zone uh, for the staff. And so that was the rationale behind it. Now we're rethinking it. Now it's, it's um, one of those things, and this is how these things happen culturally, uh, that we're considering leaving up to the regional managers. And I know that is the bane of the existence of architects and engineers who submit to DSA. But let me explain something to you and share this with your colleagues, if you would, please. And that is that um, they know best the limitations of their staff, whatever those limitations may be. And so the, the, me the modulation of work at the offices with regard we're only speaking now about the uh, um, appointment process, is something that the staff has to be comfortable with because we're throwing some other things at them that I'll get to in a minute. And so now they're feeling a bit overwhelmed by all these new processes that Chet and I are throwing on them to perform better, to uh, <coughs> return quicker, pro better projects to the districts and so we can uh, be more efficient. And so. This is one of those areas, and I promise the regional managers that I will not come into their offices and tell them how to do their job. I will be a resource to them, and I will guide them, connecting them with one another about how they can all get on the same page so that we look like a Chipotle no matter where you go. And so that's, that's uh, part of my ambition and my goal there. Um, it's, it's Probably, though, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, we will probably, before you know it, start taking all projects through the appointment process. Um, and I, I would prefer that. I think it's the best way to go. Uh, now there's going to be some growing pains. I know that. I expect that. We had growing pains with Box. 
uh, we had growing pains with inspection card, and we worked through those. And this is no different. I, I'd, I'd be doing a disservice if I set you up to think that this was going to um, come online and be perfect. It's not. We'll we'll have to tweak it. One of the things that I want to do is bring in a um, look for talent internally to serve each office as a customer service rep and a scheduler. And the value of that is that they will work with the supervising architect on scheduling the projects for the appointment process, but also um, being more customer focused, more client focused, and that is to pick up the phone and say to the A&E team, hey, we can take you a week earlier. Are you ready? Would you like to bring the project in? Or calling them a week out and saying, how's it looking? Do we need to slide the schedule a little? Because remember, we've, we've taken a hard, fast rule. If you miss that date, then what? Do you go to the back of the line? Do we give you allowances? I'm a fan of a little grace. It's just who I, how I was raised. A little grace goes a long way. And so I, I think that, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll reserve that to the regional managers, though, because they know uh, which A&E teams are um, less than efficient at submitting projects on time or submitting complete projects. And so I think it's best to leave it to them in that regard. But it's one of those things we're going to work out. We will get it right, but I'll ask your patience. I'll ask that you share that with your colleagues as well. Um, but we're, we are, make no mistake, we are trying to make an efficient process for you all, something that you can expect and rely on to be what you counted on for the decisions you made based on our information. That's what we're looking for. So, so Kurt, if, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, so I'm, I'm Kevin, and I, I call, and it's the 31st of July, and that's my first date I can call and ask for an appointment. Mm -hmm. And that appointment is going to be six weeks hence. So I'm going to be basically 14th of September for, for, for the, the, the project. And, and, and everybody's, he's guaranteeing he's going to be in the door. You're guaranteeing that he's going to be taken care of. And depending upon which office that he goes to, if it's L.A. or if it's San Diego, Oakland, or Sacramento, is, is there a difference on you know, what that threshold dollar is for the project? The conversation is yes, right now there is a difference. But the outcome will be we will take everything for the appointment process. That's the goal. It is if that's if I'm understanding you so correct. It doesn't matter. So Denny, Denny comes in the door with, with a hundred and twelve million dollar project. You're, you're good. Yeah. And Don comes in and he's got he's got something that's that's uh, quick and dirty. Five hundred thousand dollars and it has to do with roofing. Mm -hmm. All good. All good. Because Don's project shouldn't take but two to three days, and we know that because we've we've asked Don. Well, what is the project? What's the scope of the project? We have all the information to go ahead and adequately allocate the reviewer and the time allowed for that. And so then we know, okay, and then when Jenny gets here, he can hop off of that and start on that next, and that's going to be a four-week, five-week project of review. And then so on it goes with that reviewer. But it, it, is, um, it is truly asset allocation. Our assets are our staff. Time is our allocation, and that is what we're doing. Is we're taking and we're looking, and it's a, it's interesting because um, right now I'm researching software scheduling, and everybody is doing things on either longhand or on Excel. It depends which office you go to. Again, we're talking about these cultural comfort levels that people have become. It's, it's just their standard. And, and so moving them off of that is what I'm trying to do. This is part of the breaking down the silos. If I can get them all on the same software, uh, then that's great. Because then we can look from HQ at where are they at on the scheduling. And sometimes we have regional managers who are so busy working, there's a train coming that they don't hear nor see. And so we can monitor that stuff and make adjustments as necessary, if not moving work from one office to another. Or something I've learned that we can do is moving um, structural engineers from one office to another, as we're going to be doing to help out Oakland with the shortage in SEs. And so 
there's, there's a lot of good that comes from the availability of data. You were in our office last week helping us out uh, with some um, data or, or some uh, software, uh, and I appreciate that. And so there's a lot of great things coming our way with, with uh, new technology, um, but as you all, I'm sure, have appreciated in your own office, whether it's uh, CAD or BIM or even some other software you're using internally in the districts, uh, getting people to embrace it is difficult. Um, we have had people in our office say that uh, when we go to our uh, electronic plan review, uh, we'll probably lose a percentage of employees who are on the cusp anyways, and they'll say, I can't do this, I don't want to deal with it, I'm out. Fact of the matter is, the demonstrations I've been given, uh, it looks much simpler to me than flipping through sets and going back and forth, especially when you have details that are smart linked. Uh, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But again, that's people availing themselves of the technology and saying, oh, I get it now, or people saying, I don't want to know about it, and they don't. And if they want to move on, that's fine. I'll find a warm body that is bright, intelligent, and uh, interested in doing what we're interested in doing to replace them. Laura. Yeah. Take it pretty significant for us, like, you know, fair yeah. <laughs> Here's what we're expecting. Because the attribution for a lot of projects getting kicked out at intake has been that they're incomplete. Now, What we're looking at is the six week we provided to review the documents to make sure that they're a tight set of documents. That's, that's what we're hopeful happens that when we get to intake, they don't get kicked back. Now, Have I, you I, worked I, with architects for like 15 years or something? Like 34, but uh, but I, I know what you're saying, and it is a concern of ours as well, that you've waited six weeks to get into Disneyland only to find out the park's closed on the day you arrive. And, um, it's, it's something we're working through with the regional managers and intake and looking at um, the ability to provide perhaps a triage set so that we can look through it and get a better feel. Um, one of the to-do boxes that I have to check though is working with our intake architects about what it is exactly they're seeing. I'm, I'm struggling right now. What I asked for is uh, for each of them to provide me the top 60 items that they are seeing as incomplete on a set of construction documents that are submitted for every discipline that they're looking at, whether it's, you know, of the three, and, and then create a compendium from that to give to the design professionals to make sure that they're looking at these things because these are the top things that we find lacking in the drawings. I don't know why there's some feet dragging on that, but clearly there is. I've learned how to pick feet up, so it's just a matter of, of doing that. Um, but that is a concern, and you, it's a valid concern. And, and uh, I think, though, and I, in a bit I'm speaking out of school here, I think we're more likely, because we have the cloud over us of making you wait six weeks on something, to make it work for you, but there is a reciprocal expectation that we gave you six additional weeks to tighten up those drawings. That's what Chet, when Chet first laid this out for, for us, he basically, this is several months ago, he basically said, we're going to eliminate bin time, and I really didn't laugh. You know, I looked at him and I figured, okay, he's, he's looking at me straight and telling me this. But what he said was, I was an architect, I used to do this, so I know how architects think. So we submit those plans, we're not complete, I was rushed, I had 16 clients that I was trying to take care of, and there's a few details, maybe they won't see them. He said, we don't want that to happen anymore. So when they come in the door, we expect that, that, that when Kevin makes that appointment, six weeks out, the guarantee is this project's gonna be done. 
Landscaping may not be done because you don't check that, but everything that you check is going to be done. Correct. And, and that, that was emphatic from him. So the, the understanding what it is that, you know, if, if there is some latitude uh, because of, of some unknowns, and maybe it's a code issue, maybe it's something else. But I, I think that what he's trying to say is there, there's no, there's very little gray here. It's black and white. You're either done or you're not done. That's mm -hmm. the way he explained it to me. Yeah. I think you're spot on with that. Um, again, I go back to my Grace comment, though, for the initial beginning there. I think that, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they ran the diamond lane for a month before they started citing people for, for violating it to get you used to it, okay? So I think it's the same thing for us. We have to get people used to this. Um, Chet and I have had the conversation, and yes, Laura, I did work at firms and primarily in healthcare, but on the school side, I know that we also submitted incomplete sets one, to appease the client that the set was in, two, uh, because of workload, staffing. There's a variety of factors that affect you. Uh, but um, those days, I think, for the largest part, are gone. Um, there's I'm, I'm not arguing complete or non-complete. I'm arguing sometimes your list is, um, the list of the intake architect is not germane to the, um, the review. Ex expand on that because that's a new comment to me. Um, so title, it's a Title 24 child. Yeah. I want them 8 and a half by 11. Um, and they were on the drawings instead of in 8 and a half by 11. Oh, pick up the phone. Out. Pick up the phone and call me. That's a, that's a, <laughs> honestly. That's an example, but I just want to make but sure will that. Will there be a five day or so great. minor grace period to pick up minor items that they might instead of just throwing it all out? I would say yes. I, I would say that uh, it's just not in the spirit of what we're trying to do. In fact, it's it's a lot of times the, and I know from the other side, from from your side of the dais, uh, that um, oftentimes the, the DSA reaction was that if I make enough comments, I can get it off my desk and back on yours, and then I can focus on other things because my workload is is heavy right now as well. So. Let's, well, let's get out of that behavior, you know, that, that we're hot potatoing your project, uh, Jenny's project, anybody in the room's project. It's just not healthy. That's not, that's not our goal. And so, again, these are the things that I mentioned about tweaking as we go along to get this thing right. But on the 8.5 by 11 versus on the drawings, pick up the phone like you did on the Cherryland uh, problem that we're sorting through that you and I have to have an in-camera conversation about because... Um, those those kind of things, uh, they're they're, um, they're individual. I'll call them individual for lack of a better term. And it's something that that uh, oftentimes, uh, if it just comes to the regional manager's attention from me, and then they can filter it down to the supervisor, who can then have the intervention with the individual plan reviewer. Because what I like to do, like on Cherryland, is circle back. Okay, where are we at? We made commitments. Where are we at? And so, um, I always have enough time. My day is not every minute packed with something that I can't take a call, follow up on something. Chet keeps telling me it's a hard thing for me coming from from uh, being a lobbyist for AIA and then from the profession. But he keeps telling me, stop doing it. Get them to do it for you. And it's a, it's kind of a hard. It's a hard thing. Uh, you had a question? Well, just to follow up on what Laura was saying, I guess there, there would still be the question of we submit it, we think it's complete, the intake person maybe makes a comment that we think is really a good reviewer comment to, for us to discuss. How does that get back to us before we hear your thing has been picked out, your project has failed, and it's complete? How, what's that communicate with people? I don't know. I Honestly, I do not know. Um, but I can research it. And There's time in the line between what's intake and what's uh, review. Yeah. And that's I, where the line is that shifts things more to the more the intake. Yeah. And unfortunately, as we all know, this, this is in black and white. It is gray. Right. There's a lot of gray areas. If you end up being part of the discussion with the reviewer and saying, well, I'm not looking at all the intake over there, and then they're like, all right, well, let's see. It, so it, it just seems like there has to be something built in there. Yeah, um, my understanding, 
uh, is the reviewer looks for general completeness. He's not looking for, hey, uh, you've got glazing that's you know 12 inches from the strike side of the door, I'm gonna kick it out kind of thing. Um, you're telling me that occurs? Ish. <laughs> okay. That's the gray. That's yeah. The it's a conversation I can have with the regional managers, and I, you know, I, I always find it best to com, kind of construct calls with the group. So if I have a intake architects monthly call where I can download this stuff to them and get them to participate in a conversation, and it's really fun dragging out of people what their thoughts are, but putting them on the spot seems to be the best thing I found. Um, it, you get uh, results, strange results sometimes, uh, bizarre responses, but um, anyway, it's, it's a process, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about? Um, we've talked, I think, the big things about that are coming down the way with uh, fees and the appointment process. Um, oh, I know. Uh, someone brought something up to me at one of the discussions I was having with your energy group, and that was about uh, projects that they're having difficulty closing out because of uh, them being an access-only issue. Is that a common issue that you folks are experiencing, where it's access-only and our system doesn't lend itself to closing that out? Because I was informed now it's an anomaly, but I can, okay. That's one of those boxes I want to check and have someone look into, um, because I don't I don't want it to affect you on the outcome um, for the next project on that campus or on that building. So, um, all right. What else can I tell you? What else you want to hear? Go ahead. Yes. That's correct. My understanding is it's only if it's within the building of which you're doing the improvement on. So if you're doing a modernization and there's something adjacent to that in that facility, uh, then it gets kicked out. But if you're, let's say, redoing the roof and the floor of a gymnasium because they had a roof leak and a floor buckle, and then on the other side you've got a science wing that's an issue, uh, no, it won't get kicked out. Um, in fact, yesterday during the manager's meeting, uh, I declare proposed an access only uh, plan review for your campuses as an idea that might help the districts that are concerned about having a campus reviewed for accessibility. I don't know if that's something that is appealing to you, but um, or if it's a can of worms to you, or if I should just stop talking to you about it. Uh, but but uh, it, it is something that, yeah, you know what we're doing. We're always looking forward. We're trying to think of ways that we can help you. That's what that is. It's, you know, we do take a bit of a physician's oath of first do no harm, but we have a mandate. We're a state agency, and, and we have responsibilities. And, and uh, you know, the goal is not to let those conflict with your responsibilities, um, but it's a struggle. And so uh, I ask that you be patient. I know we'll be patient with you. Um, Chet has uh, big ideas, and um, he and I are both um, feeling the pressure. We know that we've probably got about two more years here uh, before the new administration comes in, and we're both anxious to get a lot done. We're both impatient, and um, there's a lot to do, and a short time to do it, really. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And That's great. So I appreciate uh, you always having us over to tell you what's going on, and I appreciate the candor of uh, what you're experiencing with us, and um, I, I'm sure you all know how to reach me. Please pick up the phone. I, I'm more than happy to talk to you and find out what the problems are. Can't fix them if I don't know. Okay. All right. So thank again, thank you very much. I appreciate sure. it. Thanks. Appreciate it. You bet. I know that was uh, important to take some time to talk about. I just appreciate, uh, you know, I've heard that DSA always, hasn't always been as transparent as Kurt's trying to be and I know Chet's trying to be. And uh, that's the part that, that I think we all appreciate. 
Okay, we have uh, a short amount of time, but I know that we have some important state, more state agency updates, and the next one is our California Department of Ed. Fred Yeager is here. So Fred, come on up. Thanks for being here. Well, good morning. Got a, a couple things to update in no particular order. Or um, Many of you remember Andrew Nave was an analyst in our office of years. We have brought him back as a manager in the office. He started last week. So he will be uh, uh, in the role of working with the, the analyst right now, plan analyst, uh, and our budgets, technology, personnel, all those things. So he, he's been doing that. So a, an experienced plan reviewer that worked at the analyst level with us for, for many years. So he's back, same email, different phone number. So uh, a nave. Uh, let's see, uh, with a, no K, with an N, A-N-A-V-E. A um, couple other things before I get to that. Uh, uh, Kurt mentioned box. So we have box also. We followed after. Uh, uh, DSA, and one of the, the, the values now of, of box as as we uh, because of staffing constraints and increased workload is that a project submitted in box allows me to move it around to an area where a person can get to it faster. If it's paper copy, if in the mail for three days, mails back, but in box I can move them around a bit more because that's something I'm doing more of now. As um, workload comes in, it may hit uh, uh, an imbalance. You know, it all comes in from right now Orange County is the happening place. So a lot of projects from Orange County. So Box allows me to move it around. So just a plug for that. Uh, also in Box, we do have a, a staging area. And we created that in response to districts who do not want to submit a full application yet. They don't have the full application ready but it's a place where they can put documents in box so all their, their team can look at it. Uh, and when they're ready, they let us know that it's ready and live and, and we can look at it. So it's uh, a number of those projects have been in our bullpen for a while. And we sent a notice out the other day to, to ask people to look at, are they live? Are you ready to review? Do you remember you started this? Is it alive, dead? So just a reminder that uh, once you put everything in, in this staging area, you have to let us know you're ready to go. So we periodically send those inquiries to make sure uh, we, we can uh, prune out some of the stuff that is no longer moving ahead. And that, again, helps us with, with the workload balancing. Um, let's see. Uh, occupancy uh, of new, new buildings. This happens, it seems, every year that we get to the last week before school and there are a lot of new projects that need an approval in a week. I don't know why it happens every year, but it does. Um, so uh, in expectation that that will happen and that there is a week, I'm going to go out on a limb here saying school's going to start in two months. Let's try to not do that in the last week. Uh, let's get that sooner because, as I mentioned, we have some as we know, many people have left, and, and we have uh, you know, down to four consultants doing this. It, it's uh, vacation schedules, other obligations. It, it may make it very difficult to get those last-minute projects uh, done before you submit your, 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 your paperwork. So uh, apply early. Let's see. One of the other things I'm seeing a lot of are paired projects of combination of modernization and new construction. Whether you're taking down 18 portables and putting in 20 classrooms, 18 under mod, to under new construction. In some cases, the district, for whatever CEQA requirements, has done that project as a neg, uh, neg deck or an ER because of the scope of the project or, or whatever their local needs are. So even though that was only a two classroom new construction project, that has to go to DTSC. It's not eligible for an exemption because you did a, a, uh, a CEQA neg deck or EIR on the t project in totality. Generally, if it's the class 14 under 10 classrooms, that, that two classroom addition would fit in there. But if it's tied to a larger project, make sure you understand that if it did a neg deck or an EIR, um, it is subject to DTSE. 
actually, Duane, I guess the proper terminology, <laughs> if it's not eligible for a categorical statutory exemption, um, it has to go to DTSC. For new construction funding, right. So in that example of 20 classrooms, the vast majority of the funding is coming out of modernization, but those two classrooms requiring new construction, uh, we would proceed perhaps with the 18, but the two new construction would be uh, not be able to be approved until DTSC was done. So just uh, as, as uh, some timing things. Let's see. And um, the other thing we're noticing a lot of, and this may be a result of uh, recovery from a recession, sites are now getting back in play, that we have heard uh, through districts or some of their community that CD has preliminary approved a site. We don't. And our 4.0 review is sometimes uh, misunderstood as that. So just as a clarification, when we do our initial site review, it's sort of a feasibility study. Uh, that indicates there's some concerns or it looks good, uh, but it is not a preliminary um, review, right? And just as another side than that, we, uh, because it is a re real estate feasibility study, we do not release it under a Public Records Act until we approve the site. So we, we, we give it to the district and the district can do as they wish, but we do not release it, so. Just. And then finally, um, in October we're having, I believe it's the third or fourth annual CDE STEM event. We've had a number of real high-quality applicants uh, put in to uh, do some facility strands. So keep an eye on that as we, as we develop the agenda on that. There will be uh, some, some exciting facility strands looking at uh, robotics and STEM and maker spaces, the, the whole spectrum, uh, pretty much uh, like uh, your event recently down the street at Washington Elementary in, in Sac City. So, and I, I believe there's also uh, a proposal submitted on that one also. So I think that's all I have. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is uh, the Office of Public School Construction, and Bar Barbara Kempernick is here. Thank you for being here, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am happy to report that it is business as usual at OPSC, and we haven't been able to say that for a lot of years. So that's probably our biggest update. We are processing applications again, so um, we have started working through with the board's action at June 5th. Um, that's the, the good news. I also wanted to touch on a few of the items that are in the state allocation board agenda later on today. We have um, two action items and then a report that's probably worth taking a look at even though it is just an update report. Um, and actually I'm gonna start there because the report um, with the board's action on June 5th, we got some questions about what that means for the application processing and what that means moving forward. So we wanted to take an opportunity to put this sort of in writing, kind of hit the high points of the process moving forward. And we've done just a brief history on the June 5th action for the board um, telling us to move forward with projects that were on the acknowledge list. And now that the projects have been moved over to the workload list, we are working on those projects. As a reminder for new construction projects, we are gonna be needing a new construction eligibility update for the year in which we process it. So for the projects we're working right now, that's our 16-17 uh, new construction eligibility piece. And then also um, we have, just wanna reassure folks that our our processing is gonna be basically the same. We still wanna have a communication process with districts where we're using our 15-day letters and our four-day letters to communicate anything with the application that needs clarification. Obviously, it's been a number of years on some of these applications, so we might need to check and make sure that everything is still the same, maybe contract dates if they haven't been entered back in 2012, maybe we have an update to that. <laughs> um, we might need state agency approval updates, things like that. So the 15 and four day letter process is still gonna be there, but we did wanna add a step because we know that you are not going to know exactly when we're getting to your application. So we're gonna add an additional communication piece where about 60 to 90 days before we think we're gonna be picking up the application and processing it, 
we're going to send you a letter and let you know and say that we expect to process application number 255 within the next certain time frame. That way you can plan for that accordingly at your school districts. You know it's coming. It gives you more time if you need to do that new construction update to get the documents together and you're not scrambling trying to accomplish everything in 15 days. So hopefully that will, will help everybody prepare um, and make for a smoother process. We also have been um, getting some questions on the small school district eligibility lock and that's probably the biggest piece of this report item. Um, we took a look at statute regulations and the board's action on June 5th and we tried to make all of that work together with the small school district lock. So we had some folks that were concerned that we would not be processing new construction eligibility if there was not a funding application tied to it and for small school districts that's a big deal. So we, we heard those comments and we appreciated those comments. So beginning with the 1617 enrollment um, updates that have been submitted, we will process those for small school districts. And those are the districts that are 2,500 students or less as reported on the 5001 form. So we will process those. That way districts can lock for that three year period past the board approval. So if you have a 1617 application, we're going to get to it, we're gonna process it. Your board approval date's what's gonna trigger that lock period. So you don't need to worry about when we get it there once the board approves it, it starts that three-year lock. And if you want to keep submitting, 1718, 1819, maybe the enrollment goes up, you want to relock, we will process those applications as well, regardless of whether or not you have a funding application submitted. Um, at this point, we cannot guarantee when we will get to actual funding applications, though. So ideally, we're getting to them within that lock period, but I can't promise that at this point. Um, we hope to make that work, um, but this is sort of the compromise that we were able to come up with to keep with the board's intent and also address the backlog and still make sure that districts kind of have that predictability built in. Um, so we've got that piece. And then the other piece we wanted to remind folks or let folks know, we have um, an item related to financial hardship on this agenda. So in this report item, we're pointing back to the board item for financial hardship because we're also getting a lot of questions on that. Because as you folks know, we've got the backlog of projects from 2012 that we're processing. Those are obviously our priority. They've been waiting. So the issue is that a lot of those projects have financial hardship requests with them. So our folks are working on those requests. At the same point, districts want to submit new applications. And as the regulations read right now, you have to get your financial hardship approval before you can submit that funding application. We don't want to hold you up. We also don't want to make it so that we ask you for the information twice, now and then when we actually get to the application. So we are proposing that the board make a regulation change to streamline this process. Um, in the action item for the financial hardship regulations, our proposal would be that you submit your 5004 to us whenever you're ready, when you have all the plan specs, all the approvals in place, you submit it, check the box that says, I would like financial hardship. You check that box, that's great. We don't want the financial hardship information yet. Once we get to processing your application, we're gonna notify you and say, okay, we're gonna process your application within 60 days, please submit the information related to the financial hardship review. At that point, we will do a concurrent review. We'll be looking at your funding applications at the same time that we're looking at your financial hardship application. So the information will be relevant to the time that we're processing. You'll only have to do it once and it won't slow you down. Once you get that financial hardship approval, anything that we expect that we're going to process within that six month window will fall under that financial hardship approval. And we will do our best not to cut you off between a project submitted on the 31st and a project submitted on the 1st. We'll make sure that we get that window to cover a batch of projects that's in the same time frame. If you have a two year gap between your projects, you might end up having to do this multiple times, but anything in the same general time frame will be covered under that financial hardship approval. So we're hopeful that the board will approve that today and uh, make that process a little, little more streamlined. Um, and that is the goal on that reg change. Yes. Yeah, they for projects that were already submitted 
that were on the acknowledge list, they had a different regulation that didn't require the financial hardship information. So the vast majority of those, we, we have to ask you for it because it wasn't submitted at the time. So that process is just kind of happening naturally. We didn't need a regulation change to make that happen. But for new projects, technically we should not accept that application without the financial hardship packet. So we needed to kind of bridge that gap moving forward in the process. But yeah, if you've already submitted, you were on the acknowledge list and we just moved you over, yes, we're gonna give you a notification period and say we need the documents now. We're trying to work, um, trying to work out in advance of that one too. So we are actually trying to get a jump start on that. So we might be asking relatively soon if you were early up on that list so that we can make sure we're getting to those projects. question is, you know, with your current staff and the current backlog of projects that are on that workload list now, how long do you anticipate it's going to take your staff to get through those projects? Yeah, we don't have that answer right now. We don't know how long it's going to be until we get to certain projects. Um, I can reassure you that we are going to be on pace for the cash that is in the 1718 budget for bond sales, so we will make sure that we keep up with that or stay ahead of that so that nobody is held up by OPSC. But I don't have estimated time frames. We're that's, that's the concern. The cash that is going to be sold, sold, the bonds are sold at $300 million, right? About $350 million. I think it's a little higher than that in the budget. For the entire 17-18 year, I think it was 594 for so Prop 51. That, that's what my question is. With $7 billion in the, in the you know, authorization, you know, it's, you don't have, it's not rocket science to do the math. It's going to take Yeah, we don't have that answer at this time. Um, the way that our staffing process works is through, it's an annual review to look at what our workload's going to be, what they're projecting to sell for, for bonds to make sure that that's in alignment with what our workload is. So for 17, 18, that's already been set, basically. Um, we've provided information based on the staffing that we have now and what we think we can reasonably get through. So um, 18, 19, it could be a different story. I'm, I'm not sure. But we do have folks that are shifting over from, um, we've had a lot of folks working heavily on policy items like grant agreements, um, any of the process changes. So now that that has, we've gotten through a large majority of that. So we're starting to shift some folks back over to application processing. Um, as you guys know, we've also got the charter round that just closed. So we've got um, Aaron Kinane who's working those applications. So she's going forward on those, got a good handle on that. So we definitely are definitely getting the applications processed and moving forward. So I think we're going to be in good shape. You might see some new faces, some new names. Um, and that's actually something else to note is that we're not operating on the traditional county system where you have a particular project manager for your particular area. We can't do it with the way the list is. So we're... I would ask that you be patient and flexible with us if you're dealing potentially with a different person in each application. We're not batching them for the sake that we're trying to keep them in date order received. We don't want to slow anybody down because we're trying to keep all of the orange um, unifieds together or um, something like that. So that is that is a bit of a change for us. But you'll st still see a couple names on the website for project managers who you can call for assistance. But at this point, you can pretty much call anyone. We're all kind of cross-training and doing a little bit of everything. So whoever you're used to talking to, um, feel free to call them, and if that's not the right person, they'll connect you. But if you have a particular application, please work with the person that is reaching out to you and sending you the letters. So a bit of a shift there. And Barbara, you'll be shifting people off of audits since audits are going to become the local responsibility. Um, in the future, yes, we do still have a backlog. Barbara, can you repeat the question, please? Sure, sorry. The question was if we're shifting people off of audits since audits are becoming the local responsibility. So yes, we expect that we'll have some changes in um, how we staff that as we work through, but we do still have a backlog of projects that need to be audited. So our existing auditors, we still see doing audits, but if we have vacancies, things like that, then, or folks that don't have sufficient workload in the future, then yeah, we can see what we can do with those resources as well. Any other questions on that piece? Okay, yes. Would GSA and CDC all go into box and 
What is OCSC suggested to be able to use something like BOSS to help with efficiency and cost? We are looking at that, um, and actually we, we tend to um, tap into DSA's system quite a bit, not necessarily BOX, but their other system for plants, so we're already using it to a certain extent on some plan reviews. Um, but we would like to do something like that and work with the other agencies on it, so it is under consideration. Um, we have the ability to um, connect to DSA's BOX through DGS, so that is definitely in the realm of possibility. We're looking at what we need to do to make that type of change, um, looking at whether we still need hard copy plans or if we can just pull the electronic ones. I think we're going to have to actually amend the form because I think right now it requires that you submit it in to us in hard copy. So we're looking at that piece. But for some of the applications that we have now, we had told folks that they could submit on a disk if they wanted to, so we're using that. Um, or we're going into DSA's um, system to look at the plans. So we do expect in the future that we will do something like that. I don't can't tell you exactly what it looks like yet because we're still working on it. But yeah, soon hopefully. Uh, um, if they're using Box, then I imagine we're all going to be connected there. We actually have a meeting I think in July. I think for all the state agents, uh, the three state agencies to get together and kind of talk about how we want to move on things like this. So. I would expect a little more conversation there in the next few weeks. But yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Barbara. Oops, it's not mine. I'm taking your papers here. Um, you know, just a comment. I, I appreciate what I see is that uh, OPSC, the staff at OPSC, has the intent to implement the program. But until they have the tools and the resources, and what I mean by that is people and bonds sold, it's going to be difficult to implement the program. And that's a challenge they face that cash is going to support them on. We need to, we need to make sure they, the agencies that are responsible for them to have the resources they need, the cash they need, and the staff they need, that's the crux of the issue. And so I'm going to assure Barbara and the people at OPSC, cash is going to be working on that. As, uh, as difficult as that challenge is, we're going to work on it. Um, Next, we have legislative regulatory issues and our staff from CASH, Rebecca Curley and Ian Padilla. Hello, everyone. Quick update from us. Uh, we know we're short on time, but we did want to let everyone know that the governor did sign the budget yesterday, so Budget Bill AB 97 and a number of trailer bills. Trailer bills are bills that implement policy changes in the budget. And there were a number of trailer bills that include items that relate to school facilities. So I wanna quickly highlight a couple of those and then my colleagues will also highlight a couple of trailer bills for you. The first one, oh, and a note, the governor did not veto anything in the budget, which is um, a sort of a unique situation. This is authority that he has to veto individual line item appropriations in the budget. He chose not to use it. So the first one that I want to mention is the new DIR trailer bill, SB 96. It makes changes to the prevailing wage monitoring program. And this change will provide both relief and some enhanced compliance in the program. I refer to this as the carrot and the stick measure. This bill is effective immediately. The governor signed it, so it has gone into effect. We need to stay tuned from DIR to hear more about how they plan to speak with you all about implementing it, but it is in effect. And what we've got here is on the relief side, this is very significant for you, that the applicability of the prevailing wage monitoring program will, the threshold is changing. Currently, it is for projects that are $1,000 and above. That's that public works dollar amount that's in statute. We're increasing that threshold to 15,000 for maintenance projects and 25,000 for construction projects. You also get a little bit more time to file your PWC 100 forms. So that's exciting. Right now, you've only got five days from contract award to file those with DIR. You'll now have 30 days. The only exception being if you go, if you start work before that 30-day period is up, you need to file your PWC 100 
before that work starts. So if it's sooner than 30 days, you'll need to get it into DIR before the 30 day time is up. On the compliance side, the stick, we can't just get something we want. Uh, we've got some additional penalties and some new penalties that have been created. So for GCs and subs that are not registered correctly, they've got increased penalties. For awarding bodies, and that includes school districts, you now have a new penalty structure. So for violations, you can be subject to a fine of $100 a day up to $10,000 per project. And then there's a new penalty on top of that, which says that if you are deemed to be a willful violator, twice within a 12 month period, you will lose state facility funding for a year. So that's pretty significant. Note the term willful violator though, that does have some legal precedent. And uh, DIR is also now empowered to issue stop work orders. Um, just another provision that's in this bill is related to the contractor registration fee. It is going up from $300 to $400. That's not actually something that they needed statute to be able to do. DIR does have the authority to adjust that fee on their own, but it's written into this new trailer bill. And the last thing to note is that contractors will be able to register for more than one year at a time if they choose. It's just an option up to three years at a time. That option does not go into effect until June 1st of 2019. So my read of the bill is that that's the only provision that does not go into effect immediately. Just want to mention one other trailer bill on school facilities. It's AB 99. That's actually the larger education finance trailer bill. There are lots of little nuggets in there, uh, some of which apply to school facilities. One of those is this is the home for the new audit trailer bill language. So shifting that audit function for state funded projects from OPSC down to the local level that is housed in this trailer bill, AB 99. That one has been signed by the governor as has SB 96, which I just mentioned. And just a quick note on this one, it does apply to SFP projects that are funded after April 1st, 2017. So if you were on that acknowledged list, now the workload list, this will be a process that you will need to abide by. I also wanna mention that Cash was successful in arguing for a really significant change to this trailer bill. There was a provision in the bill that said that any audit exceptions, so any ineligible expenditures identified by your auditor would be automatically repaid out of your Prop 98 apportionment, your operational dollars. We argued successfully that current law should be maintained, that you should have the decision where you want those funds to come from for any repayments. So you you could use capital dollars or you can use operational dollars. We were successful in getting that into the bill. So I'll stop there, just quickly see if there are any questions. I know there's a lot to digest on the DIR and we'll continue to communicate with you and anything that we receive from DIR that provides more clarity, we'll share with you as well. All right, thanks, Ian. Good morning, almost afternoon. Uh, I will also be quick. <clears throat> um, so we're going to uh, hold a, uh, a cash legislative advisory uh, meeting today in this room starting at 1 o'clock. Um, Tom Duffy is going to be there and uh, uh, be on hand to talk more in more detail and, and be able to handle some questions on Prop 51 implementation. Uh, Don talked a little bit about that, but uh, uh, we'll have that. And then certainly to go through the bills that Cash is still following and that has positions on. Um, we're ba basically at the 50-yard line now, and so this will be a good opportunity to, to uh, 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 see what's alive, what still has legs. But uh, um, the subject matter now and all year has been remarkably remarkably consistent with regard to what types of bills we're looking at. Accountability and transparency bills are, are far and away the most significant ones. We're still chasing five or six of those uh, around. Some we, we were able to amend in the first house and were able to go neutral on, but uh, we're still chasing some um, around. Um, the other big uh, uh, theme, of course, is water, and that's all I'll talk to you very briefly uh, uh, about today. And um, so that's, that's basically uh, uh, what's, hap what's happening uh, uh, today at the LAC. 
In terms of water bills and programs, I did want to remind you that there's a couple of uh, key programs with regard to water and, and lead testing. One is the program that allows uh, municipalities or, or uh, local water agencies to test for free uh, uh, for lead and also an associated uh, a grant program. It's a $9.5 million grant program being developed by the Water, uh, uh, water Board as well as the uh, uh, Department of Education. Um, and so those are, uh, um, that's, uh, it's not completely developed yet, but uh, that's going to be a key piece going forward here, wh whichever of these bills pass. Two key, uh, at the 50 yard line, two key water and lead bills are, are, are floating around, uh, uh, no pun intended. Um, AB 746, and that is Gonzalez Fletcher. And uh, that has, well, I won't go into a, a whole bunch on that one, but that basically requires some testing, some notifications. If something is found, uh, a problem is found, in other words, if, uh, uh, if a, threat, a testing threshold is, is, is breached, um, what it would require is that the, this system, the offending system, to be shut off. Now, uh, that's not a perfect solution, but previously it required installation of, of uh, filters, uh, in some cases complete uh, 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 replacement of the plumbing. So we see this as progress. We're continuing to uh, uh, work with the, with the authors, and, and, uh, um, and some of the other organizations already are pretty close to neutral in support. Uh, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue to work on those. We got a couple of stormwater bills uh, that we're working on also. Um, but unless there's any other questions, uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation at this point. All right, well, thank you very much. And again, if you're interested in any of the legislation, please come to our uh, 1 o'clock LAC. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Mm -hmm. thank you, Ian. And next is Julie Arthur, uh, the vice chair and the chair of the, the uh, annual conference. We have great plans going. I'm really excited about the conference, continuing that next-gen theme, bigger, better than ever. Julie. Hi, good morning. Um, just want to give you a quick update. Right now, we've received about 150 proposals for workshops and roundtables. And so we've sent those out to our strand chairs and co-chairs, and we're looking at those. Our next actual meeting that we're going to have is going to be July 26th. So next month, right after this meeting, we'll have our annual planning committee meeting. So we're going to want everyone involved in that to be here and attend that. Also wanted to let you know some exciting things with it is we are actually looking at bringing back the keynote speakers. So we're looking at on Tuesday probably to have a keynote speaker come in and speak, uh, which is exciting. And as Don mentioned, our next gen is, um, I think as they say in Washington, D.C., going to be huge. It's just really bigger and better than anything else, and, and it will hugely be successful. So I think that's about it on the update. Any questions or anything? No? Great. Thank you. Hi, all. So the budget agreement is signed. Um, that is a good thing for those of us who are waiting to find out whether there, that encumbrance state extension would happen. Um, and we're excited to tell you that, yes, it's very, um, it was a long haul, let me just say. Uh, we worked very hard on extending that encumbrance date to June 30th, 2019. Now, big question that's been coming up is, what does that mean for the CEC's EEP deadline, the Energy Expenditure Plan final deadline that they put out there um, when they thought that the encumbrance date was uh, going to mean that we had contracts signed and invoices and all of those things. So at this point, the CEC is probably not going to do anything about moving that deadline, although we do expect that it will be moved out because there's trailer bill language now, SB 110, that is, um, takes the SB 518 De Leon bill that we talked about in the past, I don't know when I was here last, two months ago, um, and incorporates that language into this trailer bill. Um, what it also does, because of the strong work and advocacy that we, and the input we got from you all, um, also incorporates that March 1st, 
2018 date as the new final EEP deadline. So what that means is before that it said that's the date that the money would be swept. So then we expected the CEC to, the, to bounce back from there and we didn't think the August 1st deadline would move at all. So at this point now we're looking at March 1st, 2018 if SB 110 gets signed as the new EEP deadline. That's great news for all of us who uh, hadn't yet seen our allocations for that final fifth year, and we're also very concerned about, um, about August 1st being right around the corner. So what we're waiting for now is SB 110 to be signed, um, and they do have a few days and weeks to do that in uh, as part of the state budget. Um, but we already have that June 30th, 2019 date uh, in the budget agreement. So it's all good news. Um, stay tuned. And as soon as it gets signed, we'll be letting you all know. But for now, don't expect that date to move or anything from the CEC because they do know that SB 110 is out there as well. And so they're, you know, they're not going to move it before they know whether or not SB 110 gets signed or not. Um, we will have a draft letter available to you to send to the governor to encourage him to sign SB 110. We want you to tell him about your projects and what you could do to go further. In that SB 110 bill is also the removal of the sunset on the Prop 39 program that allows it to go on uh, indefinitely, which is also great news. And the funding post-encumbrance uh, state is also being focused on LEAs um, for clean energy buses, for low and no income loans, and by competitive application for schools who want to go further and use that funding toward energy efficiency and renewable. So gosh, I you know just have a lot of good news for you today. Um, if you have any questions about the details, please feel free to call me. Um, we also have bills that we're following. Um, AB 1082, which is that electric vehicle infrastructure bill that schools will be able to apply for getting uh, EV infrastructure on their campuses. Um, there's also SB 356, which is energy data uh, uh, transparency bill, for lack of a better word. Um, and there's one more on energy uh, solar battery storage, um, SB 700. Any details that you may need, please feel free to call me anytime. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anna. As you know, we always do a job exchange opportunity. Anybody in here from our school districts or other organizations that have a, a job advertisement they want to advertise, so free advertising moment. Okay. Seeing none. We're a little late, so I'll get right to adjournment. Thank you for being here, especially to our state agencies. We really appreciate their participation. Thank you, and have a great day and afternoon.